As you know, years ago, Native Americans used to communicate with each other through smoke signals. If you lived in the 50s and 60s or watched television in those years, you saw lots of Westerns. If you're new, nobody, they're not Westerns anymore hardly, but they used to be back in those days, that's about all there was. And you'd see this all the time. They'd, they'd communicate, these tribes would communicate with smoke signals. On the morning of July 15th, 1945, as a part of the Manhattan Project, the pale-faced United States government successfully tested the first nuclear bomb in Almo Gordo, New Mexico. Now, most of you have seen photos or videos of the mushroom cloud that comes from one of these bombs. It's rumored that a Native American in that area saw the huge mushroom cloud in the sky and said to his friend, Kimo Sabi, I wish I'd said that. <laughs> I'll take it whenever you get around to it, okay? That's what Tonto used to call the Lone Ranger, Kimo Sabi. Today's message is one of those. I wish I'd said that. Someone gave me a transcript of a message by a pastor I've never met named Bob Carey. It's brilliant. I've reworked it so it wouldn't be as good as his was. You'll get that in a minute. But I wanted to give credit where credit was due for his profound insight. One of the things we've been learning around here over the last few months is how to interpret Scripture accurately because it can be wrong and even dangerous to interpret it literally. No verse in the Bible stands on its own. Every book, chapter, and verse must be interpreted in light of what the rest of the Bible says. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses the issue of forgiving people in Matthew 6, verse 12, and then 14 to 15. They're in your outline. Read along with me. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. If you forgive others for their transgressions, then your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. If you take these words literally, then you end up with a wrong understanding about forgiveness. Literally, this would mean that a person whose sin has been forgiven when he was saved can later lose his salvation because he failed to forgive someone who hurt him. Is that what this means? Someone is brutalized and raped. Someone was physically abused or molested as a child. Someone murders your loved one. Someone lies and destroys your reputation or career. Someone cheats you out of a lot of money, etc., etc., etc. Are you supposed to forgive that person? What if they never asked for forgiveness? What if they never acknowledged that they had done anything wrong? What if they're still trying to harm you? In a message called Battling the Unbelief of Bitterness, popular preacher and writer John Piper tells a story of a woman who said to him, I could never forgive my mother for what she did to me as a child. Piper said to her, and I quote, Do you not realize that if you're unwilling to forgive your mother, God will be unwilling to forgive your sin and you won't go to heaven? Was Piper right or was Piper wrong? True story, not here. A young girl was sexually abused by her youth director in her church over a period of years. She finally got the courage to send a letter to her pastor about that abuse. He called her and asked her to come into his office, which she did. The pastor got up with the letter, ripped it in front of her, and told her that God commands her to forgive and forget. He then began to admonish her for her sin of unforgiveness. She left afraid and confused, and the abuse continued for several more years. Was the pastor right? Or was he wrong? Today I want to talk to you about understanding forgiveness. And I want to ask three questions. What does it mean to forgive? When should I forgive? And why should I forgive? We'll spend most part on the first two. So in your outline, what does it mean to forgive? To forgive is to let go. To let go. You just saw the video of dropping the rock, letting go. 
Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. This is a verse about God's forgiveness. In the Old Testament Hebrew, the primary word used for forgiveness is nas nasa, which means to take or carry away. In the New Testament Greek, it's aphiomi, and it means to send away, to release, to let go. So what we see here is the root idea of forgiveness is letting go. So what do we let go of? There are three kinds of forgiveness referred to in the Bible, and they differ by who lets go and what gets let go of. Dr. Steve Tracy of Phoenix Seminary gave the names to these three types or kinds of forgiveness. They're in your outline. Three kinds of forgiveness. Number one is judicial forgiveness. Sometimes the Bible is talking about judicial forgiveness. In judicial forgiveness, God the judge lets go of something. The guilt of our sin, and he declares us righteous. Judicial forgiveness is justification. Only God can give judicial forgiveness. No one else can wipe away or let go of our sin so that we can go to heaven. In Luke 5, 21, the Pharisee said to Jesus, who can forgive sins but God alone? They were right. Nobody can extend judicial forgiveness but God. In Ephesians 1, 7, it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses, the letting go of them according to the riches of his grace. In judicial forgiveness, God is the one who lets go of something, and what he lets go of is the guilt of our sin. So we no longer will be eternally judged for our sin. It has been forgiven. God has let go of it. Now, the second kind of forgiveness is psychological forgiveness. Psychological forgiveness. Psychological forgiveness is extended by us, not by God. And there's two parts of it. Number one, we let go of hatred and revenge. Someone has hurt us and we let go of hatred and revenge. You probably heard the expression, bury the hatchet. When hurt by others, some people use the hatchet to hurt others back. Do unto others as they have done unto you is kind of their philosophy. The Bible tells us not to do this. In Romans 12, 17 to 19, it says this, never pay back evil to evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, which means it isn't always, so far as it depends on you, which means it also depends on another person, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now others, they don't use the hatchet. What they do is when they get hurt is they bury the hatchet. And they bury the hatchet somewhere where they can find it if they ever need it again. And if it's ever necessary to use it on the person they want to use it on. This too is not what scripture tells us to do. We're not to use the hatchet. We're not to bury the hatchet. What God wants us to do is to destroy the hatchet. Sometimes people claim to forgive someone for what that person has done to them. Or to, or to someone they love, but they resurrect the offense as needed to have leverage over the person who hurt them so they can punish them in the future. A new problem arises and they get historical. Well, you did this to me, but you said you forgave me of that. See, they haven't destroyed the hatchet, they buried it. Now they have a reason to reuse the hatchet. And so they bring up an old sin, an old wrong that's supposed to, that was supposed to have been forgiveness, forgiven. Real forgiveness means that you will not use what I say I've forgiven you of to control or hurt you in the future. So if I've said I forgive you, so you've asked for forgiveness, I've said I forgive you, then I cannot use that in the future to come back and hurt you with it. It's more than just saying something. It's letting go of hatred and revenge. And the second thing, it, we extend grace. It's something we do. We extend grace. Luke 9 or 6, 27 and 8. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. 
Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Now, I want you to listen real closely because this is real significant. Notice that we're not commanded to like our enemies. God never commands us to feel something. God commands us to do something. Psychological forgiveness is choosing to extend grace rather than to retaliate. If someone deeply hurt you, listen closely. If someone deeply hurt you and you're not retaliating, I think you're loving your enemy and being obedient to these verses. I'll say that again. If someone deeply hurt you and you are not retaliating, then I think you are loving your enemy and are obedient to these verses. What is God's love? Does it mean that we can do anything we want to do and he treats us as though we always did the right thing? Yes or no? If you know your Bible, the answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. God judges sin. Does it mean that we have the same relationship with God no matter how we live? Again, the biblical answer to that question is no. So what does it mean when we say God loves us? It doesn't mean we can do anything, act any way, get away with anything we want to do, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't change our relationship with God. It doesn't mean that. So what does it mean? It means that God chooses not to give us what we have earned and deserve, and he chooses to give us what we have not earned and what we do not deserve. Now, we'll say that again. God's love means that he chooses not to give us what we have earned and deserved. And he chooses to give us what we have not earned and do not deserve. We deserve judgment in hell, but instead he gives us grace. Grace is not getting what we do deserve and getting from God what we don't deserve. So how do you love your enemy? You choose not to treat him as he deserves, but rather as he does not deserve. If someone has harmed you, you love, do good to, bless that person when you don't retaliate and do to them what they have earned and what they deserve. Did you get that? I want to say that again. If someone has harmed you, you love your enemy, do good to your enemy, bless your enemy, when you don't retaliate and do to them what they have earned and do deserve. How many of you believe in this word called justice? Come on, I want to see your hand. You ought to. God, God, you're made in the image of God. He believes in it. See, the only way, hell is justice. Heaven is grace. And we can get grace because justice was served, because Jesus died on the cross in our place for our sin. God punished for him for our sin, which means that God was just. And God in Christ redeemed us from the guilt and penalty of our sin. And so God was the justifier of those of us who have faith in him. But God is absolutely a God of justice. And wrongs should be made right and punished. And so that's the way God is. Loving your enemy has nothing to do with feeling a certain way towards someone or wanting to have a relationship with the person who wronged you. If someone kills someone you love, you love that person by not killing him. Now you may be thinking, well, you're giving all these arbitrary examples. No, every example I'm giving is somebody's real story. In the Old Testament, you could run down any, if, if somebody killed somebody in my, family, in my family, even if it was an accident, I could track them down and kill them, and it was just. Do you know that? They built these cities of refuge, and the person, if you were guilty of Capital One, first degree murder, you couldn't escape it anywhere. But if it was an accident, you had to go to this city of, re, of uh, refuge and stay there for X amount of years or until the high priest died, and then after that, your, the family could not avenge your death. But prior to that, they could. And so someone killed your brother, you could kill him. Or your mother or your wife, you could kill them. And it was just. If someone kills someone you love and you, you love that person by not killing him, that in and of itself is walking in love and grace. Do you get that? 
Anger is a normal reaction to being wronged. How many of you, when you are wronged, get angry? See your hand. That makes you normal. If you don't get angry when somebody wrongs you, something inside of you is broken. God gets angry about wrongs. You do know that, don't you? Ephesians 4, 26 says, be angry, but do not sin. God himself is angry towards sin. The one who loves best hurts most. God loves you. Therefore, God is angry whenever someone hurts or wrongs you. As a parent, if someone hurts or wrongs your child, how many of you would get angry? Well, you should. You should. You know why? Because you're made in the image of God. And you hate injustice and you hate wrong and you love what's right. And so God's the same way. If someone hurts you, the person who loves you the most hurts the most. And who is that person? Well, that person's God. <laughs> Since he loves best, he hurts most. He's more angry about the wrong done to you than you are. Now, why am I saying this? Because some of you have anger and you keep beating yourself up for that anger and God's not the least bit mad at you for your anger. It's not evidence that you're carnal. It's not evidence that you're unforgiving. It's evidence that you're honest, that you're human, and that you're not living in denial. Denial is being fake. It's being hypocritical, which God is being inauthentic, ungenuine. None of the above, which God likes us to be. Your anger is normal, and you can't cure normal. God just asks us to live above our emotions, not to be controlled by them. So say, somebody's hurt me, and every time I think about it, I get angry. Of course you do. And it's not wrong. It's human. It's normal. But now what you've got to do as a believer is you've got to decide that this anger, this emotion will not control my behavior. What God wants me to do, what I ought to do, what the right thing is to do by the word is what I will do with my anger and I will not let it control me. So psychological forgiveness is letting go of what that person did to you. We're gonna come back to the whys of that later. Now the third kind of forgiveness, there's judicial forgiveness where God lets go of the guilt of our sin, none of us can offer that kind of forgiveness to anybody. Somebody wrongs for you, you can't forgive them so they get to heaven. You don't have that option. There's psychological forgiveness and we're the ones who let go of something and what we let go of is the desire or need to retaliate and avenge what they did to us. And if you've done that, you've let go, you've forgiven. Then we come to relational forgiveness. Relational forgiveness is letting go of the relational barriers that are the result of being wronged. It's restoring harmony in a relationship. So under that, number one, God lets go of relational barriers. That's what God does. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what's he talking about here? He's not talking about judicial matters. He's talking about relational matters. 1 John 1, 9 is not about judicial forgiveness. It's about relational forgiveness. At salvation, we are justified, forgiven, declared righteous. Our sin is forgiven and we are bound for heaven. Post-salvation sin does not jeopardize our salvation. It just separates us from the relationship with God that we were supposed to have. My current sin keeps me from the life I'm supposed to be living. When I repent and confess that sin, my fellowship with God is restored. Did you follow all that? See, when you come to Christ, you were justified, declared righteous, forgiven of your sin. That means you're going to heaven, not because of what you have done, but because you have put your faith in what Jesus did for you. That does include repentance and it does include believing. But now how many of you, like me, have sinned at least once since you were saved? Come on. Now what that sin does, that sin breaks the fellowship we have with God. And so it's not gonna keep me out of heaven, but what I've gotta do is go to God and confess that sin 
And that clears up the relationship so that now I'm back in fellowship with God, with the kind of relationship I'm supposed to have. So when we talk about relational forgiveness, that's what God does when he lets go when we confess our sin. Otherwise, I continue to separate myself from the God I'm supposed to be connected to. Now, number two under that, we let go of relational barriers. We let go of relational barriers. Here's where we come to this idea of reconciliation. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 13, a man is living in in an immoral relationship with his father's wife. He has refused to repent, and he's been put out of the church. In 2 Corinthians 2, 7 to 8, the man has repented, and Paul instructs the church to welcome the former sinner back into the fellowship. Here the church now has let go of the former offense and has restored their relationship with this man who formerly was a sinner, but now has repented, and now there's been relational forgiveness. He's back in the church. Now, as a point of clarification, let me give you five things that forgiveness is not. Number one, forgiveness is not forgetting. The pastor said to the girl, you have to forgive and forget. There's no place in the Bible that says you're, you have to or are supposed to forget what anybody did to you. Jeremiah 31, 34, God says there, their sin I'll remember no more. Again, he's using a, an expression to make a point. It's not that God gets amnesia. God does not literally forget our sin. God is omniscient, all-knowing. And therefore, he cannot not know. If there's something God doesn't know, then God's not all-knowing. He's no longer omniscient, right? So he has to know. This verse means that God relates to us as though we had not sinned. Remembering the hurt does not mean that you haven't forgiven someone. So it's meant forgiveness is not forgetting. Number two, forgiveness is not a feeling. It's not a feeling. That you still feel pain when you're reminded of the hurt done to you is not an, is not an indication that you've not forgiven your offender. It's proof that you're human and that you're not living in denial. Joseph had forgiven his brothers, but he wept when he first saw them as he remembered their betrayal of him. He later told them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Forgiveness is not a feeling. You say, well, I still have this anger toward this person who hurt you. That's normal and you can't cure normal. You don't have to, that anger does not have to disappear for you to have forgiven the person who hurt you. Now here's the third thing. Forgiveness is not tolerance. Romans 12, 19, vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. God doesn't tolerate. Forgiveness is not tolerance. It doesn't mean that you have to continue to accept the mistreatment of your perpetrator. Forgiveness doesn't void the consequences of the wrong done. God forgives us, but he does not tolerate our sin. If you think you can just sin and sin and sin on God and he's just some big old puppy that won't won't take action about that, you do not understand the God of the Bible at all. He's a good father and he loves you and sin hurts you so he hates sin. And he wants the best for you and the best for you is when you do what he tells you to do. Then he can bless you like he wants to bless you. Forgiveness is not tolerance. Well, if I've forgiven him, I should keep, have, to, have to keep tolerating behavior. No, you do not. And that's not what it means. Number four, forgiveness is not trusting. It's not trusting. You might forgive someone who took you for some money, but doesn't mean that you would trust them with money in the future. Forgiveness is not trusting someone who wronged you who has not re-earned your trust. So when someone has, has wronged you, you know, uh, kids do this all the time. You know, they do something they're not supposed to do. Parents catch them, get on to them. And then next time the parents has rule, the kid says, well, you don't trust me. Now, kids, let me give you what the parents are thinking in their head. Of course I don't trust you. <laughs> For many reasons. One, you've given me reason not to trust you. Two, I was your age one day. And my parents shouldn't have trusted me. Forgiveness is not trusting. 
Well, I've forgiven you. That just means I trust whatever you do in the future. I just, that means I just go blank dead and uh, brain dead, blank minded, and I go blind, and I just act as though none of what ever happened in the past ever happened. That's not forgiveness. That's stupid. Forgiveness is not trusting. Number five, forgiveness is not words. Forgiveness is about what you do, not just what you say. I'm going to say this in light of next week's message. The spiritual life is not something you show off on. If you're showing off how spiritual, godly, mature, whatever word you want to use, you're not any of the above. And you can do this, this thing of forgiveness. Well, this man raped me, so I'm going to go see him and tell him I forgive him. Doesn't that sound spiritual? Wouldn't that make a great movie? But you've got to ask the question, is it really being honest and real to have that conversation? Is it maybe more denial and show than it is authentic and genuine and necessary? I'll let you land on that where you want to, but I know where I land. Forgiveness is not words. You don't have to tell somebody you forgave them if you have. Now, here's the second question we want to ask. When should I forgive? Well, back, by the way, let's, let's back up a little bit. So we have judicial forgiveness. God lets go of the guilt of our sin. We can't ever extend that. We have relational forgiveness. Uh, and under that, you know, we, we let go of our need to retaliate. It's something we choose to do. And then uh, there is, that's psychological forgiveness. Then we have relational forgiveness where we determine whether or not we might have a relationship and be in kind of fellowship with that person in the future. So we're talking about for, uh, forgiveness now. We've talked about who, and now we're going to talk about when I forgive. What is forgiveness now? When should I forgive? Some misunderstand these types of forgiveness and think that they ought to, for, you ought to forgive everybody for everything and that forgiveness means that you forget and that the relationship goes back to its pre-offense condition. They seem to have forgotten that God doesn't forgive everybody. Right? Anybody ever heard of a place called hell? People go there who are not forgiven. So God doesn't forgive everybody. So why would God ask you to do something he's not even willing to do? So whatever forgiveness is, it's got to fit inside this category of who God is and what God does, right? Now, in Luke 13, 3 to 5, Jesus says, unless you repent, you will all perish. So he's talking about forgiven. If a person doesn't repent, they can't be forgiven. Now, under that, psychological forgiveness should be given unconditionally. And this is a big one for a bunch of you today. Psychological forgiveness, letting go, dropping the rock, rather than throwing it, you're using it, should be given unconditionally. That's what these verses are about. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. In, in Ephesians 4, 31, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. What he's talking about there is dropping the rock, destroying the hatchet, not retaliating, even though they deserve it and have earned it. Psychological forgiveness is to be given unconditionally. Psychological forgiveness means that we choose to let go of what they did to us and move on. Now listen, we don't do this for their sake, we do it for ours. We don't extend this type of forgiveness because they deserve it, they may not, they probably don't. But because we don't deserve to be bitter and angry. It doesn't mean that what they did was okay. It doesn't mean that you forget. It doesn't mean that you no longer have pain over the hurt. And it doesn't mean that you have to have a relationship with that person now. 
Psychological forgiveness means that you will not allow the person who hurt you then to continue to hurt you now. You will not allow past hurts to continue to hurt you in the present and in the future. It means that that person who hurt you will no longer control you. It means that you'll go on in peace rather than being bound up with hatred and bitterness. Psychological forgiveness is for you. It is not for them. Whether they repented and confessed or not, whether they asked for forgiveness or not, you let it go. This is one way that you fulfill Romans 12, 21. It says, overcome evil with good. So, so psychological forgiveness, it ought to be given unconditionally. Why? Because no person who hurt you has the right to control you now. You didn't have an option in what happened then. You've got all the option in what happens now. What you want is God and his love and his peace and his joy to control you. Not anger and hate from what they did to you. Nothing undoes what happened, but you can drop the rock. You can drop the rock. And in a long life, you're going to drop a lot of rocks if you're going to be a person who lives in peace and has joy. You're going to drop a lot of rocks because you're going to be hurt a lot. Now, relational forgiveness. Relational forgiveness should be given conditionally. The first psychological is unconditional. It doesn't matter what they do because you're letting go. You're not letting go because they deserve it or have earned it. You're letting go because you're no longer going to let them control you and keep you from having God's love, joy, and peace in your life. But when it comes to relational forgiveness, where you have reconciliation with a person, that's to be given conditionally. That's what God does. Verse John 1, 9. We get separated from him. Our fellowship is broken. The only way for that to get back is there's a condition. And the condition is I have to confess my sin, repent of it, and then I can be back in the relationship with God I was made for. In Luke 17, 3, it says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. This is what it's talking about. It's talking about relational forgiveness. Relational forgiveness should not be given unconditionally. Forgiveness doesn't unscramble eggs. We can all be forgiven of our sin, but forgiveness does not mean that there are no consequences to our sin. David was forgiven of his sin with Bathsheba, but he paid for it the rest of his entire life. Psychological forgiveness doesn't require or always result in relational forgiveness. We need to let go and move on, but it doesn't necessarily restore the friendship, put the marriage back together, or heal the parent-child relationship. Some of you have been deeply hurt by your parents. You long for a mother you're never going to have in this life, for a father you're never going to have in this life. And you can live with anger about what they did or didn't do for you, or you can be at peace today and just let go. Just realize in the lottery of parents you lost. You scratched and there was nothing good under the scratch, okay? No, I don't buy lottery tickets, but anyway. You got to let go. Because the problem is not what your parents did to you then. The problem is what you continue to do to yourself now because of what they did then and because you won't let go. Do you know the Humpty Dumpty principle? If you'll recall, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty back together again. Everything that gets broken doesn't get fixed. Now, I know what somebody's saying. Well, God can do anything. Write this in your outline. But he doesn't do everything. We're not talking about God's ability. We're not talking about what God actually does and does not do. Does God heal everybody? Yes or no? No. Does, it, does God fix every one of our problems? Yes or no? No. Does God keep all of us from danger? Yes or no? No. Not all the time. Maybe he does sometimes. We don't know it. It's our job to extend psychological forgiveness when we get hurt and then determine if relational forgiveness should be offered to the one who hurt us. 
It's not my job or yours to decide if others should offer relational forgiveness to those who hurt them. And it's not their job to decide what we ought to do with that. Psychological forgiveness, letting go, absolutely. Relational forgiveness, reconciliation, it depends. And sometimes there's adequate remorse, repentance, uh, repair, and, uh, and promise not to repeat. And when those things are given, sometimes, yes, the, the relationship can have some kind of reconciliation. In most cases, it will never be what it could have been, but it could possibly be better than it was. But it doesn't mean that that happens every time. Now, last one, why should I forgive? Luke 13, 3 and 5, again, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all perish. So he's told us that we're supposed to forgive. So obviously, we need to do that. Number one, Jesus commanded us to forgive. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors, Matthew 6, 12. So if he's commanded us to do it, we ought to do it. Again, we're not talking about judicial forgiveness. We're not talking about relational forgiveness. We're talking about psychological forgiveness. Number two, we need to forgive for our own well-being. Colossians three fifteen. let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Jot down Hebrews 12, 15. And there it says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. How do you do that? He's going to tell us. That no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. See, the truth is, when we get bitter, it just doesn't affect us. It affects other people around us. We start turning other people against other people. We start creating other problems. It's like a, it's like a poison. It's like a cancer. So he says, don't come up short of the grace of God and end up bitter. It's bad for you. It's bad for everybody around you. Bitter poison, bitterness poisons not just you, but those around you. Now, here's the third one. Being in God's will requires us to forgive. Again, not relational forgiveness, psychological forgiveness. These verses in Matthew 6, uh, verses 9 and 10, come at the end of what we know as the Lord's Prayer, this model prayer begins with, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Well, what's he talking about? He's talking about forgiving our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. So what do we leave with today? We're going to have an altar call. This isn't for us, it's for you. Sometimes, especially on matters like today, in fact, I can't think of any other better reason to have an open altar for people to come and let go of something than this one. I really can't. Sometimes coming to a certain place, coming out of your comfort zone, makes this more important and meaningful and creates a better memory bank for you that I let that go. I remember. I went down at Corrington Church. I went down the front of their church and I let go. In an audience this size, there have been a lot of big hurts suffered. Some of you, some have been hurt by parents. Some have been hurt by kids. Some have been hurt by dates. I guarantee you there's a handful of people, well, ladies, maybe more than that, who've been date raped in this room. And some have been hurt by mates. Some of you have been abused by your husbands. And some by your wives. Some of you have been stabbed in the back by colleagues or friends. Some of you have been hurt by someone in a church somewhere. Some of you have been hurt by someone in this church. Some of you have adequately forgiven your fender. Listen closely. But you keep thinking you haven't because of your memory. Because of your reoccurring pain over it. Because of your occasional anger over what was done to you. What you feel is normal, and you can't cure normal. If you're not retaliating and seeking to avenge yourself, you're doing great. Somebody has deeply hurt you, and you're not trying to hurt them back, you're doing great. Quit beating yourself up. I want you to let go of that false guilt 
that you've been carrying. That's not guilt you have from God. It's a false guilt the devil wants to keep you weighed down and bound up with. There's no place in the Bible that says we have to, we're to forget what someone did to us or that we're to feel any sort of warmth or closeness just towards someone who hurt us. I want you to come and let go of beating yourself up. You are going to remember. It's always going to hurt when you do. But you can't choose, you can choose to let go and move on every time your pain reoccurs. And a bunch of you haven't let go of what was said about you or done to you. The truth will make you free. You need to psychologically forgive your offender. He might not deserve it, but you do. Your bitterness punishes you, not him or her. You don't have to like the person to be or be in any future relationship with that person. But listen, if you don't let go, that person will be in every relationship in your life and in your future. Do you understand that? If I'm bitter and I get married, I've just carried bitter into my relationship with my wife. And I have children, my parenting is influenced by the bitterness I carry around. And my friendships, and my walk with the Lord, and my everything. Wherever you go, there you are. And whatever you are, there it is. You got to let it go. And by the way, letting go is not a once and done decision. You decide to let go, the pain reappears, you decide to let go. You feel hurt all over again, and you decide to let go. And you see or hear their name, and you decide to let go. And as you let go over and over and over again, letting go gets easier to do and begins to feel more genuine to you. Your emotions begin to catch up with your mind and your will. So come and begin to be free. Free to have peace again, free to enjoy life again.